Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for coming. Today, I'll be talking about Open Source Azure, one of the core um, hyperparameter tuning systems we have at Google. And this is also partially a um, hands-on tutorial. So it'd be nice if you guys, if you wanted to um, get out your laptops to try to code along. But if not, that's totally fine as well. Because partially, I'll be showing how you guys can for example, optimize a cookie recipe. So I'll be um, baking cookies, virtual cookies today. So yeah, but let me first go through the slides and introduction. So yeah, um, my name is Richard, and here's another Richard. And um, I'll, I'll be first talking about the core um, uh, <laughs> client API and also the um, algorithm API. And then Richard, the other Richard, will be talking about the benchmarks API. So by the way, yeah, here's the website for our uh, tutorial. So there's also a link to a collab um, that I'll be presenting later on. And also here are some additional links, such as the code documentation, you know, our blog post, our paper, and our open review back from last year. And so in the approximate schedule of this, we'll first be going through an overview, then a hands-on on the basics of how to use Vizier. Then maybe an optional deep dive on like how this is actually working. Um, 15 minutes are spent for the algorithm API, um, and then last uh, for the hands-on is the benchmarks API. Uh, that's given by Rich the other Richard. And we'll have 10 more minutes for questions. Yeah, and also maybe optionally some extras. But so as an overview, um, here's the Vizier team. I'd like to emphasize that this is a team project, and there's no one person who did all of this. And it was definitely um, the combination of multiple uh, people's experiences and their expertises, such as in systems, in optimization, in um, software engineering, et cetera. Um, and this also includes some teams, such as the Brain AutoML team, um, other teams, uh, other external contributors as well. So as an overview, I'd first like to start off by giving a brief background on Google Vizier, the internal version. So Google Vizier tunes many of Google's research and products, and it has thousands of monthly users, um, and it's tuned millions of objectives. So some notable users and downstream wins includes search, ads, YouTube, right? Big money-making businesses for Google. Um, but also it has tuned research results such as things like hardware design, robotics, protein design, um, yeah. And also it's um, also pr uh, been used as a backend for other people's optimization um, algorithms. So it doesn't, you don't, you're not forced to use any of Vizier's algorithms here. So for example, the old neural architecture search papers, the very first ones, actually used Vizier as a backend to handle all of their gigantic GPU um, runs. And it's also been used for things like AutoML Zero, some quite a bit, uh, for like a symbolic algorithm search. Yeah. So the big question we get asked all the time is, why is Vizier a service? So there are a wide variety of scenarios, right, in hyperparameter tuning. So normally you'd use it to tune just like large machine learning models, but you can also use it to tune chemicals and biological processes. You can also, of course, use it to bake cookies. My team has actually used this to bake cookies, and you know, people said it's been pretty tasty. I've never done it before, but, but that's been 2017. So the key here is that they're all very different workflows. And so there are different workflow possibilities, right? One is the evaluation latency, which can be seconds to weeks. Evaluation budget, which can be like just 10 trials or like tens of millions of trials. Um, it can also be either asynchronous or synchronous, which means you uh, perform evaluations in batches. And also some evaluations can even fail, right? Like for whatever reason. And there are other features like early stopping to stop the uh, training of a model if it's deemed like too low, low um, uh, you know, it's deemed really bad. So the benefits of a service is that there are no evaluation assumptions, right? Users have the freedom of when to request trials, evaluate trials, and report results. And the service can preserve data on prior usage. This is now becoming extremely important as 
um, Google emphasizes on large model training. So all of the large LLM model trainings are actually stored, the, the data from that, right, the, the, the metrics are stored inside um, our Google uh, internal data store. And also, for example, we use this data to um, train our old um, Opformer, which was a lar like sort of like language model that um, was performing optimization, right, in a GPT-like setting. Um, so now, open source Vizier we released in 2022, and it's a standalone and customizable Python code base, and the user can host their own services, right? You don't need a central, you don't need Google to host your service at all. You can do it yourself. This means you have control over almost everything. So now i like to uh, move to the hands-on basics of how this actually works. So uh, before that, though, um, let me just give you a rundown of the, like, like the basic definitions, right? So like just for, you know, keeping, like a study is just in the entire optimization run, and a study config is the configuration, right, that says what is my search space, what algorithm I'm, am I using, what may be the noise settings, et cetera. Right, and like parameter config, metric config, right, these should be straightforward. Parameter config specifies what type of parameter it is. Is it a floating point? It is, it is, uh, is it a categorical, et cetera? Metric config, right, is it, are we maximizing or minimizing? Things like that. And so in Vizier, right, the core ones are basically like double integer, discrete, and categorical. Uh, there's no surprises there, but we also allow um, different scaling types like uniform or log scaling, especially for things like learning rate, which uh, you either, you'd rather use log scaling, and also things like conditional parameters, all right? Like um, if this parameter is active, then so are these other parameters, right? This is common for like, you know, like if you're choosing the SGD optimizer, then you'll have this type of hyperparameters. If you're using Atom, then you'll have like momentum parameters that don't exist for other parameters. Uh, don't exist for other um, optimizers. So now let me change this to the um, collab. Yeah, so yes. So basically, um, let's just start here. So right now, um, all you need to do is install the Google Vizier and the JAX version just to allow our JAX algorithms. And I've already done that so that you don't have to do it. So basically, let's say that I want to bake some cookies, right? Um, so basically, let's say like as a, you know, synthetic, you know, example, let's say the taste is equal to some function of how much chocolate I want in the cookies, right? This function, which is just a quadratic function. And since I already know that just by inspection, chocolate, if the chocolate value is 0 0.3, then it's maximized, right? Just, just keep in mind this um, when we're doing the optimization. So first things first is, okay, how do we set up the problem statement for this kind of optimization problem, right? So what we're gonna do is, um, yeah, let me write some code now. So what we're gonna do is first import from vizier.service, import um, pyvizier as vz. So this is just in, uh, uh, getting out the Python API for vizier. Then let's set up the problem, right? So th this is vz.problem statement. Yeah, and then I'm going to set up the search space now. So problem dot search space dot root dot add float pram, and then let's say chocolate, right? And then let me set the bounds for this to be like between zero and one. Then let me set up the uh, metric information, which says that what exactly are we maximizing or minimizing? So this is uh, is that metric information name, right, let's call it a name, uh, taste, oops. And then let's say the goal is vz.objective metric goal dot maximize, right? And then let me write down the evaluation function, just exactly, right, the basic Python function. So define evaluate, evaluate chocolate, right? This is a floating point. So, and then it outputs float. Yeah, and then return one minus two times uh, chocolate minus 0 0.3. Yeah, so let me run the cell right now. So it creates it. So now, um, if we go down, 
the question is, okay, how do we optimize this search space, right? So in this case, I'm gonna have to start importing the Vizier um, client API. So for example, Vizier.service import And then here's where I create the study config to also specify things like the algorithm. So, um, yeah, let me do this. And then here's why I can say which algorithm do I want. So, we're gonna use is the standard algorithm we have. So this is the Gaussian process bandit. And then what I'm gonna do here is write a client for this. So clients.study dot from study config um, owner equals me and then um, study ID equals cookie. Right, so let me sec, study config, and then just to make sure, yeah, this should work. And so if I want to actually start the um, service and try to get suggestions from this, um, from Vizier, I'll use the client to ping the service. So what I'm gonna do is the client, right, so suggestions equals client dot um, suggest, and then count equals one. Uh, let's see, for, yeah. And then, like, for suggestion, in suggestions, um, I can get the chocolate here, equals suggestion dot parameters, chocolate. And then, Here's the objective, evaluate chocolate. And then let me present, print out what the X and Y's are, so chocolate, objective. And lastly, I have to make this into a measurement, so final measurement equals um, dot measurement taste objective. And then suggestion dot complete final measurement. So here's gonna be the optimization loop going on here. Yeah, oops, one sec. Um, oops, that was, yeah. So as I'm going along, there are some random syntax errors. That's always gonna happen. Um, yeah, so now you'll see that the um, Vizier service is uh, uh, suggesting X's and I'm evaluating the Y's, right? So you'll see here that like it first starts at the center of the search space and then right here is the actual objective. Then I, I fit it back in and completed it. And so now it gets updated and then it sees, um, then it tries to give out like, you know, 0 0.27, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is a complete optimization loop. Yeah. So now, what if I wanted to um, obtain the historical, right? As I'm doing this optimization, it's, I might have like hundreds or millions of trials. So the question is, how do I obtain, you know, maybe the best trial seen so far, and also the historical trials? So in this case, um, basically, our API is going to do this. So um, let's try. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call the client the optimal trials and then it returns back a list of what are called trial clients. So these are not actual trials so far. These are like um, clients because we're still in this lazy evaluation to conserve like memory, RAM, things like that, right? So I'm going, I have to materialize this later on, but let's just do this. So list, right, zero. So I'm just gonna attain the first optimal trial. And then finally, I'm going to get the actual trial using the materialize, so dot materialize, yeah. And then let's just print out the optimal trial. Yeah, so you can see 
here, uh, it's already very close, right? Our optimal is 0.3, well, it's already gotten this very closely. And so the measurement, I believe, um, I can't scroll, like this probably got, I think here, 0.3, and it got like 0.99, right? Something like, some, one of these. So this is how I got the optimal trial. Now, let me just plot this, right? I'm, um, and see what's going on. So if we plot this, Yeah, this is, I mean, this is just regular like matplotlib, right? Like I'm just gonna obtain the parameters and then the evaluations, the x's and y's, and um, now I'm gonna get a plot, right? So, I mean, this is a quadratic, the blue, blue represents the function, the red represents the trials, and then the x represents the um, optimal scene objective. So now, um, I'm not gonna go into de too much detail, right? These are just like follow-up examples. Um, where like, okay, what if we have multiple parameters con uh, uh, controlling the taste? So now we have an additional salt and sugar parameters. Um, what are we gonna do here? Well, that's kind of obvious. We do exactly the same thing as before, um, where we add, add additional floating point parameters, uh, but do something, everything the same as before. But I can also change the algorithm to let's say random search, right? Like if Gaussian process bandit is too slow for some reason, and I need like 100 trials immediately, we can call the random search. And here I create the new uh, study, right? I'm gonna ch I change a new name here to be new cookie recipes. This is now a new study. And then I do the loop all over again. And so here's the loop that's actually going on here, right? Like all this. Um, yeah. So that's that. Let me do this. Yeah. And so another thing that's very important is this is the reason why we set Vizier as a service in the first place, is that it allows distributed computation um, and it handled this very well, right? So I can have multiple clients working at the same time. Um, I don't need to evaluate the objective one by one because in certain cases that's too slow, right? In batched algorithms, this is extremely important to reduce computational resources if I have like multiple CPU workers. And so we can try to simulate this, right? Like normally you'd do it with like multiple machines or something, but I can also simulate this with multi-threading. So for example, what I'm gonna do here is um, since my computer might have like, I don't know, 16 CPUs, something like that, um, what I can do is I'm gonna call the multi-processing um, package, and then what I'm gonna do is I can just do the exact same thing as before where I create the client, and I'm gonna loop the client again and then perform evaluations, but each of these is now wrapped in a thread function, and then the thread function is now used in like a multi-processing pool, and once I do that, um, right, like I can basically have multiple workers running the, um, uh, each running a client, and then each talking to the Vizier server, and um, yeah, that's like the parallel computation side. Um, let's see, if I can just, uh, let me, um, hide output, yeah, okay. So now, uh, another thing is that, right, I never said where this Vizier server even lives in, right? Like, all I've done so far is talk about the client. So, like, we, we have no clue where the Vizier server is working on. So, by default, it's, lo uh, it's working locally, which means that it's being run on, like, the same process as its collab, and it's not shown for the uh, sake of uh, user simplicity. But if you wanted to create your own server, let's say you have, like, 10 client machines and one server machine to handle all this. So you can explicitly do this, and how you're gonna do it is basically um, use our server API, right? You go from the service API, and then you're going to um, create a default server here, and basically in the server machine, that just stays for alive forever, right? And then these are just regular distributed you know, connection endpoints, so you just set the server's um, address, as like this server endpoint environment variable. And so from now on, every client will be able to connect to this specific server instead, instead of the local um, one we were just running. So for example, if I run the cell right now, 
It's fine. Yeah. So um, that's basically the, like that's if you didn't want to know anything else about how to use Vizier, this is the core um, service that you should know. Um, yeah. Let me now move to the algorithm section. Um, let me exit. Yeah. So I guess like as a as a sort of like, I'll go through this quickly, but right. But what is actually happening inside our system is that there's a server client procedure where the client sends a RPC to the server, and then the server starts what's called a PDO policy, which I'll discuss later. And but basically, this is just an algorithm. And while it's working on the algorithm, there's a lot of like um, settings, and um, there's a lot of like. Uh, what we call protobufs or uh, containers that keep track of what's going on throughout the entire computation. And then basically the client will keep pinging the server, are you done yet, are you done yet, are you done yet? And to verify the status of uh, the operation, right? And then finally the client receives the suggestion once it's um, uh, uh, successful. So here's an animation where you can have multiple clients all talking to the, um, actually let me maximize this, yeah. We have multiple clients talking to the service. The service now uh, processes these requests. They send it to the what's called a Pythia service, which is like an algorithm um, service. And then it also tr keeps track of everything and saves all that to the data store here. Yeah, for the for safekeeping in case like any of these APIs go down, right? If any of these machines like blow up or something, um, then you can still always recover using the data store. So. Yeah, like these are just technical details such as like we use standard protobufs to deal with the remote procedure calls. Um, we use GPR, gRPC as the uh, API for doing this. And one key thing is that Vizier is independent of the language, right? The client can be of any language because um, the, the server can, uh, should run in Python, but the client can be anything, right? So that includes Python, C++, whatever, because all you're doing is just paying the server. And so therefore it supports, right, all these different languages. And it also supports all these different platforms because in a distributed setting, right, the client can be of different, you know, like configuration from the server. And so yeah, that's why we imported PyBazir is that like rather than deal with all these like distributed systems kind of APIs, we wrap it into raw native Python to make it easier to work with. Yeah. And now I'm gonna try to go into the algorithm API here. Um, so this is now more for the type of people who are researchers and who want to use this to write their own algorithms, especially our Bayesian optimization library. Um, and you know, test their own algorithms, things like that. So um, the first things first is that here's usually the typical algorithm design, right? Like almost every algorithm is basically just saying like, right? It can be updated by the re results of some optimization like evaluation, and then it can also suggest new evaluations given this history, right? The problem is that this is not good just using this will not work for a service. The reason for this is that in a service, right, you need to ensure fault tolerance on algorithms. This is a key difference between, um, I guess, like, this is, this is a key jump between regular research and making it work on an actual um, production system, is that you have to handle all these kind of fault tolerances, these issues. So um, the core solution we used is that we need to be able to recover the algorithm when needed in case something, you know, the server crashes or, or dies or something. And so um, what, what we do is basically, since we have the data store and it stores all the histories of the optimization loop, we can use these historical trials as the algorithm state, right? So therefore we can query the history and um, depending on the implementation, the algorithm can basically choose whatever, you know, historical points of data it needs to uh, recover its state. And this is very useful for algorithms which work in batches and populations, right? For example, if you're running a gigantic NAS run with like regularized evolution, you need to be able to keep track of all these previous trials and, you know, the population size for your evolution algorithm. You can do that with um, Vizier. 
So this includes, yeah, includes genetic algorithms. So here's how we handle this um, in our system. So this is the API for the policy. So this is one step ahead of designers. So in our policy, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have this object called a policy supporter, which you can use to query previous trials to recover the state, right? This policy supporter API basically says, okay, give me the first trial, give me the fifth year's trial, et cetera. Give me all trials with this kind of status, things like that. And also the designer, which is wrapped, right? This is the logic for the stateless algorithm. So what's gonna happen in this wrapper usually is that during the suggest call of the policy, I'm going to use the policy supporter to load all the trials seen so far um, both like the completed trials, the ones that are successfully evaluated, plus the active ones that the user has not, the client has not evaluated yet, right? I have both, uh, both sources of data that basically parameterize at what position I'm in in my algorithm. Then I um, load the algorithm using these completed and active trials. Then I finally obtain the suggestions from this stateless algorithm. Um, you'll notice that this might be slightly efficient if I'm required to like load in literally all trials, right? If I'm working on evolution algorithm and my history is like millions of trials long, then it's very inefficient to load all of them. So the policy supporter also allows selectively loading certain trials and also it can load in things like metadata, right? Like you can save algorithm states in JSON or string format and then you can reload them back. So that's one um, core design choice that we used. So uh, as a reference, um, here's the algorithms included in our package so far. So these are the classic ones such as random search, grid search, you know, shuffle, you know, shuffle grid search, and you know, quasi-random. Evolution algorithms such as CMAES, NSGA, et cetera. Um, Boolean ones from the research literature like harmonica box, and also the Bayesian optimization one, the default one that's used in both internal and external, which is what we call GP Bandit. Richard Zhang will go into more details in his section of the talk later. But now let me uh, try to show you how this API actually works. So, yeah. So basically, um, let's start off with the uh, regular search space that we had before, like the 1D chocolate search space. And essentially, um, let's import, let's say, like our grid designer, right? So it's already, already been written for us. I just want to play around with it, right? So let's use grid designer to generate the first five suggestions, right? Oops. So let's try this. This is really simple. It would just be for, um, right, suggestions equals grid designer dot suggest. Uh, count equals five, and then for s in suggestions, print s. Let me first reload this. Yeah, and then let me do this. Right, so you'll see obviously this is now performing grid search because it's starting between like the boundaries zero and one, and it you know uh, partitions the um, continuous space into like maybe I think 10 grid points. So that's why, or, or 11 or something. And so um, it goes from zero to 0 0.111, 0 0.22, et cetera, right? That's, that's all fine and dandy. Now, um, you'll notice that um, basically this designer, like the, a question when you're putting this into the service is how do you save the state of this designer, right? So what we have already implemented is that um, grid search is what we call a partially serializable designer where it allows you to load and dump its state into a serializable format, okay? And these are form, form like the metadata. So let's try to um, look at the current state of this algorithm, right? So what I can do is this, and then grid designer dot dump. Right, so now currently um, its output is five, right? The five is track, keeping track of how many suggestions I've made, and it's the location of what, should the, what the, uh, next trial should be. Now, um, I can also change the internal state via the load function, 
And so, for example, let me, let me try to change the state and let's say change the starting point of grid designer to something else, right? Instead of just five. So what I can do here is, right? Yeah. So once I have the metadata already, right? I can, this is just some bookkeeping, like this is basically a dictionary um, with some name spaces, but otherwise I can just do current index equals, and then let me change it to something like seven, right? And then grid designer dot load metadata. And then let's try to suggest the grid designer now. So suggest, right, and then zero. Yeah, so you'll see exactly here, it's, do, it's now restarting at seven instead of the, uh, well, it should have been five, right? So here's, here's how you can hijack the state of a algorithm, and here's what's happening underneath the service is that these, um, this state is being loaded and saved, loaded and s saved, things like that, throughout the entire course of the optimization loop. Yes. So now, um, like if we wanted to put this grid designer into our actual service, right? Let's say I written an actual algorithm that, that's clearly like not, not just grid search, right? But let's say I written my own algorithm, which is in a designer API, and I want to actually host it inside of Azure and allow it to be used in a distributed setting. So how do we do that? Well, we have to wrap it as the policy API, right? So here's, um, I'm not, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna show, um, I'm not gonna do it myself. But basically what's going to happen is that um, I'm going to create this, what's called a policy factory, and essentially, right, the policy factory allows you to, you know, take in some problem statement here, and then um, also it allows you to figure out what algorithm you're using and things like that. So basically, I can sort of write this as, like, if the algorithm string is, let's say, grid search, then I'm going to just simply wrap this as a designer policy um, that's partially serializable, and then I give it the initialization function of the grid designer, and I just send these things, right, because this policy support is needed during the service to, uh, to check, okay, how do I load and save the, um, the uh, agnum state from the database, right? So, and then lastly, let's say that I want to load this policy factory into the new Vizier server, so I want to host it, right, uh, uh, for, for everybody. So, oops, yeah. So how do I do this? Well, this is very simple, right? I just create the policy factory here, and then I load it into this default uh, Vizier server because that's part of its initialization, right? Normally, if you don't specify this, it just loads our entire list of algorithms that I showed before, but if you wanted to hijack this and create your own policy factory, this is how you do it. So uh, this is actually very important for a lot of our integrations, such as with um, uh, a package called PyGlove, which was used by the NAS AutoML, uh, the Brain AutoML team for performing huge neural architecture searches, right? Like, for example, um, for PyGlove, they use um, like they perform combinatorial optimization, and so they have to uh, create their own algorithms, some of which are not even designers, right? They can actually create their own um, algorithms that don't really follow any of our API, but they can wrap it into like this policy factory and then load in the server and et cetera. Um, so that's how, generally speaking, the core of Azure service works inside of Google. Now, um, at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Richard to discuss benchmarking as well. This is also important for researchers. Yeah. Do you, do you need to like, reload it? No, it's fine. Actually, before you go, uh, since we're kind of on time, actually early, before, uh, earlier on time, um, do any of you guys have some quick questions for Richard, the other Richard? Yeah. yeah. We'll also have more time afterwards. Is there a boom mic, or do we need the boom mic? Oh. I'm not a basketball player or anything, but... Oh, that was great. Uh, can you... Is it working? Is it working? Maybe just one quick question. Yeah, sure.
So I think the question is about how is Vizier managing the distributed computation of multiple clients? On uh, auto scaling? Um, right. So um, it, the user actually defines how many clients they want to use. However, these work, I can imagine, you can imagine where like, you know, you have like a thousand CPU workers and some of them can die at any time, they can pop up any time. That's completely fine because you can create the client on any of these CPU workers and then these clients, hello? Okay, these clients are now um, pinging the server at any time. The server handles all these clients. Um, so for example, if each client uh, calls like request a suggestion, the server will handle this and um, push, uh, right, give a suggestion to that client. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Like the service basically uh, knows how to handle like all these gigantic clients because it's really wrapped as a regular server. Uh, it's more like the, the what we call a client here is more like one evaluator, yeah, in, in our definitions. Um, but like you can totally write your own package to say like handle, oh, how many workers do I want to set up? How, and therefore each worker has a client and, and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so I would say um, as for the raw package, we don't have any kind of settings to sort of auto scale CPU workers because uh, we want the user to have the full control over the things like that. So, but, but let me show an example of like what might happen. Let's say if you're running a gigantic evolutionary algorithm. Um, so for example, if you go into our documentation here and uh, go into advanced topics here, so let's, this is an example of like how we, we actually integrated with Py, PyGlove, right? So for example, in the PyGlove API, you can also define your own search space, how you're gonna, uh, uh, the algorithm, et cetera. And you can also define your own objective function. And so like, right, then you can create your own server. And so this is the exact same setup as before where um, we can create like our own work function on, on each, um, worker, and each worker launches this, right, either like multiple threads, single process, or multiple processes, or just literally multiple machines where each, each machine um, uh, runs that uh, work function. Um, I hope that answers the question, but yeah, we, we don't do auto-scaling technically. Yeah. Yes. Some kind of, some kind of uh, optimization, kind of cross algorithm. I'm not talking about optimization of one algorithm uh, trials, but cross algorithm trials. Just, I mean, like to stop maybe some algorithms which are not performing that well after, like, let's say, five iterations or something like that. I see. Um, so uh, about the multiple algorithms. So since the server can handle like any study config, right? Each study config. Um, you can specify what kind of algorithm you want, 
right? So, so over here, for example, like let's say user one is optimizing with random search on this specific search space. In tandem, user two, another student, let's say, of the university, can be uh, optimizing you with another algorithm. So mm -hmm. the server can, is able to handle multiple requests, each with multiple different types of algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, as for like this kind of automatic algorithm, uh, it's not a it's not a thing. Yeah, oh. that that yeah. Most of the time, uh, at Google, users just say like, "I want you to optimize my objective function with this algorithm," and a core service just handles it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Y y y yes. We read the question from uh, Andre actually. Um, so he has a technical question. Uh, as far as I understood, the interface with the custom policy factory is super flexible. Um, if I want to implement a multi-fidelity algorithm, does the custom policy then need to take care of the budget, or would that need to be sent to the policy as an argument? Yeah. I would say for multi-fidelity uh, support, you would need to essentially add it as a parameter in your study config so that the algorithm want to understand for each trial what is the cost, approximate cost for evaluating that trial. And then the policy could use that information to decide which trials to evaluate in your search space for the next suggestion. The other part I do want to mention is that you are not locked to any of this in the sense that each of our basic primitives in Vizier has this thing called a metadata field, right? So, um, is it here? It's, yeah, it's here. Not a stopping, sorry, one sec. So, each object, each primitive in zero has this thing called a metadata field, right? So, in principle, you, you might not, never actually need to use the, um, the parameters, like the primary config, right, our, our standard API at all, right? You can literally use Vizier as this like skeleton for just handling distributed jobs, and literally you write all your algorithms using this metadata like as a communication service, right? And that's exactly how we did it with PyGlove, because PyGlove um, has a lot of combinatorial primitives that are not naturally supported by Vizier. What PyGlove just does is serialize all its things, shove it into the Vizier metadata fields in the right places, and then basically Vizier just acts, uh, acts as this like distributed server. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. Yeah, so that's, there's a lot of flexibility among these kind of um, things as well. Hi, um, maybe just a quick question about um, profiling. So does Vizier do any kind of thing like tracking memory, man in, um, how much memory was used or how long some function took or anything of that sort? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, yeah, so um, in the internal service, yes, we can actually track certain metadata like that. Um, uh, for the open source for service, like we currently don't really track that this kind of stuff that much. But you can, if you wanted to do it yourself, you can always use this metadata field, right? A trial in Vizier has um, this metadata field, and so you can actually store this kind of metadata in a trial, and then it gets stored into Vizier and um, things like that. So we we meant we meant this metadata to allow even more features wanted by user, even though we might not by default support it. Yeah. Okay, cool. I guess Richard will be talking about benchmarks. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Richard. I'm the other Richard on the Vizier team. Ooh. Switch over. Switch. Yeah, switch it. It's not quite sure. Yeah, you need this other one. Um, yeah, move this guy here, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, and then maximize this guy, and then here. 
Oh, just regular. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Richard. I'm going to talk to you about benchmarking. So, as you know, there's a lot of algorithms you can implement. There's also a lot of benchmarks you want to try so that you can test and make sure that your algorithms are doing well. And so, I'm going to talk about how to do that in a easy, relatively easy way, and also to see how well your algorithms are doing. So, benchmarking goals. Um, generally speaking, we want to find good optimizers in machine learning, and that's a goal for all of us, I'm sure, whether, no matter what setting you're in, if multi-fidelity, if you want to do like different algorithms, you know, ensembling, um, we also support early stopping. We have a bunch of features, but no matter what you want to do, you probably still need to figure out how well you're doing. So there was a black box optimization challenge in NeurIPS 2020, um, where the goal was to find the best black box optimizer for machine learning, which is a very generic task. Um, in, in their setting, I think, which is the setting that Vizier relatively targets in its current iteration, um, it's just the vanilla, there's no batch setting, it's sequential optimization, I think single objective, nothing fancy there. Um, and so a lot of these papers and these challenges, they require good benchmarking to discover these state-of-the-art algorithms. There were a bunch of uh, industry and also academic um, competitors who joined, and you can see the results of the benchmark or of the competition at the um, Neuros website if you want to take a look at it. But generally speaking, there are a few goals. One is we need to find a good and diverse set of benchmarks to make sure that, and metrics to make sure that our, our algorithms are doing well. Um, it's like a common issue where, you know, you have only a few metrics that you care about and then the whole ML community overfits to those benchmarks. So for like ImageNet or something like that, you know, there's just more and more CNNs at this point that is doing quite well, where in reality, a lot of the field has moved on to transformers. Um, it also allows for easy comparison with other algorithms. We want to make sure that we can quickly compare with other state-of-the-art algorithms so that we want to make sure that it's doing quite well. Um, we want to reduce human interpretation biases. So in general, like the way we design metrics and benchmarks could be slightly biased. We might. Uh, not even realize it, but the way we design it will favor a certain type of algorithm versus the other. Um, we also want to remove possible confusion with plots. So oftentimes you read a paper and you look at a plot. I mean, who has written, read a paper and have, has actually read the whole experimental section from, from start to finish? I don't know, at least I, I don't. But I look at the plots. Everyone looks at plots, right? You look immediately figure one. <laughs> and read the caption <laughs> and look at what the things mean. And sometimes it's, it's really hard to even tell what's going on. So hopefully we can try to take a stab at standardizing all of it, so some of that. I mean, obviously we can't fix the entire problem of standardizing benchmarks. I mean, maybe it's good or a bad thing. I don't know. I can't tell if it's a good thing that we standardize benchmarks. But we want to mention what we provide here at Vizier in terms of benchmarking for you guys to quickly test your algorithms and also to see how well you guys are doing. Um, so we include a bunch of benchmarks in our suite. Uh, we have the typical BBOB functions, uh, which is a bunch of synthetic functions that we use for, uh, for black box testing. And then we also have other uh, synthetic functions from the Nash Bench set, which is a neural architecture search data set. Uh, we also have for transfer learning capabilities, um, testing of the HP, HPOB benchmarks. Uh, RL type data sets for those who are interested in that, those sort of environments for Atari games. And on top of that, we have these utility functions to generate more benchmarks or objective functions from these objective functions by adding noise, shifting, sparsifying, et cetera. So you can just have this whole cl extra class no matter what type of setting you're in. If it's a noisy setting, you can quickly test how well your algorithm is doing. So the Vizier default that we recommend that you guys would benchmark against when you guys cite Vizier, <laughs> um, basically don't use any, I mean, the, this is the default. So if you import our search and then you run it, this is, should be the one that you're using, is the GP banded. And so we'll just go, quickly go over why it would be um, a, a competitive uh, bench uh, algorithm. So it's inspired by a C++ setting back in the day in the very uh, good old days of C++ coding in machine learning at Google. 
Um, we use a Gaussian, pro right now it is in Python, as obviously this whole package is in Python. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so auto diff, I guess, was technically already there in 2015, but yes, maybe like 2010. Um, a Gaussian, we use a Gaussian process kernel, which is pretty standard uh, in Bayesian optimization. Uh, we, we use a maturing kernel with the optional linear kernel addition. Uh, some of the features that we use is we use the UCB acquisition with a trust region. Uh, it basically changes the way we explore the space. Um, and then we optimize it using an evolutionary optimizer to optimize the acquisition function, acquisition function for those of you guys who are familiar with Bayesian optimization. If not, it's fine. Um, we also have in, in input and output warping. So these are features that, honestly, all of this, there are features that you can try out and play, play around with, and we really welcome you guys to do that. Um, so the input and output warping basically just changes the way the X and Ys are represented so that it's more amenable to our models, which is, in this case, a Gaussian process. Uh, so there's some notion of smoothing and removal of outliers. Um, so that uh, the model can somewhat fit the, the data well. Um, and uh, obviously in our case, we, we don't care as much about the actual values of the Y, we just care more about the rankings. So that's why we can do a lot of uh, the input-output warpings. Um, we also tune our models to make sure that it's the best fit over different kernels. So that's known in this field called as, as ARD, Automatic Relevance Determination. And we also optimize some of the priors that we use for these kernel hyperparameters. Uh, and so this landscape, by the way, is quite difficult to optimize. We've tried a bunch of different optimizers, and the basic ones like Atom do not work. So we use a LBFGSB constraint optimizer, and we also tune and ensemble some of the priors. So we have some notion of like an MCMC type approach. So we just want to say that uh, we believe there are some algorithmic advantages to our Python implementation of Vizier GP Banded. One is uh, compared to other algorithms in maybe like Bayesian optimization packages, the standard ones that you would download. Um, we support auto diff and GPU via JAX and TensorFlow probability. So TensorFlow probability for you guys who don't know is like this library that quickly allows you to use distributional tools, such as computing the log probability of Gaussians or T distributions or whatever distribution you want. Um, it also has tools for sampling like MCMC and other optimizers that you can use besides LBFGS and Atom and typical ones that you are familiar with. Um, and, and so for those who are interested in using those tools, you can quickly integrate those tools with our uh, current implementation because that is what our implementation is based off of. Um, so yeah, most other packages only use NumPy or scikit-learn. There's obviously, I think, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch as well, but you know, it's like pros and cons to that. Um, we also want you guys to have an ability to quickly change our implementation for, you know, trying out new algorithms with the modular components that we have, like the components that we, I just mentioned in the previous slide. So if you want to change the priors, you can. If you want to change the hyperparameters, you can. And you can do that in a way that's also differentiable. So if you want to learn on top of priors, like a hybrid prior, you can. You know, there's like, uh, or if you want to learn a more advanced output warping that's differentiable, you can. Um, and so we want you guys to be able to quickly try those things out, and you can. Um, <clears throat> there's also advanced tricks that we use in just our GP that uh, I think will do quite well in general. So we just welcome you guys to try some of these things and see how well it does with or without our current tricks. Those are a little more heuristical, I will admit. Um, we also have many features. So yes, there's a lot of settings that we kind of try to support. Obviously, there is a very general API, the early start, uh, the Pythia policy API. So if you guys take a look at that, you most likely can fit in any setting that you guys want. But uh, the specific ones that we definitely support are categorical discrete variables, the batch mass setting, which is basically partial information. You have some trials that are filled and some trials that are not. Sometimes a metric that is filled 
filled as incompleted, like you have that information. Um, so the partial information setting we're supporting with algorithms like UCB PE. Um, also the multi-metrics setting, so when there are multiple objectives, uh, trying to find the Pareto frontier, and we have like scalarization-based techniques that's based off of like provable techniques. Okay, so generally speaking, the benchmark API is meant to be flexible. So uh, the goal of this slide is to say, our benchmark API is uh, based off of this idea of like every benchmark is a state. So as you've realized, like we care a lot about states and serialization within Google, just uh, within this specific OSS Vizier, just to make sure that we're fault tolerant, but also it's easy to see what's going on. And so the benchmark state has the experimenter, which is essentially the objective function, and then the algorithm, which is the, known as a policy suggester, but it wraps uh, the policy, which Richard went over, and the policy supporter. The policy supporter is essentially, you can think of as a data store. The policy is being supported by the policy supporter is the algorithm. So um, benchmarks, our benchmark protocols, the way we run benchmarks, review benchmark, is just like you're changing something in this benchmark state. I mean, your benchmark state is generally only gonna comprise of those three things. And the benchmark protocols are essentially mutators, and those mutators can be specified and then parallelized to run across uh, different benchmark states. So they're known to, I mean, we designed them so that they have maximal flexibility, and um, it wraps the policy support of policy experiment too. We also have Ray integration. So for those who are familiar with Raytune, um, it's basically a package that allows you to try a bunch of different algorithms and also distribute it. I think they might have auto-scaling for those who care about auto-scaling. Um, but uh, yeah, they're a little more um, focused perhaps on productionization as well. But yeah, so in terms of research, they also provide this nice integration for with other libraries, which is really great for trying out other algorithms. And so we also integrate with the Raytune API. So what that means is we support very quick search base and config conversions. We have a Vizier searcher right now. It's within OSS Vizier. So you would need to, I mean, it's integrated with the API. So we'll see example where I think we will just run Vizier search. Um, it's not fully integrated with Ray, as in it hasn't been submitted to their code base, but the integration is already done. Yeah, we have a tutorial collab in our read to docs, read the docs on how to run benchmarks with our Vizier client. So on, on Ray. So it's do you can do that right now if you want. Um, parallelism support on Ray on Cloud. So whoever, if you're using Google Cloud for your ML needs, you can also essentially uh, integrate with Ray, both Ray and Vizier, uh, and Cloud Vizier. So that's for those who are running production um, ML systems. So we want to emphasize that the performance that we find on Vizier default is quite competitive, um, especially when using these best performance plots across different benchmarks. So here's an example of running a BBOV function. The y-axis is the best objective that we've seen so far after running an uh, a given amount of trials, the number of trials given by the x-axis. And we compared against a bunch of uh, algorithms, and we use actually Ray to do this. These are most of the algorithms that support on Ray. And we see that Ax, for example, is also quite competitive. And v v Vizier obviously does quite well as well. Um, and honestly, there's a bunch of tricks and tips that we use there. It's like, uh, th that I went over before, but it took I would say a long time to optimize this, this uh, algorithm. So we expect it to do quite well. Um, if you have any you know, better algorithms, please let us know because we'll be interested. Um, but also this idea of well is often ill-defined and this is one of the issues I think in this field. Oftentimes you're a little frustrated perhaps like all the different comparisons, everyone wants to be state of the art. Um, so the, there are general questions, obviously we can't answer them, and this is not a talk on benchmarking. Uh, we do maybe, we we'll, might have a paper coming out, but um, 
Yeah, so th there's a lot of questions on like how do we quantify performance, how do we make sure it's robust, how do we aggregate across benchmarks when it's not obvious how to combine different benchmarking settings, and how do we diversify the benchmarks and also across the time horizon. So one partial solution that we add to that is we have an analysis platform or API or like a quick plugin uh, to add al analysis metrics that are normalized across different benchmarks. So performance can be subjective. We want to make sure that perhaps there, maybe there's not one metric to rule them all. <laughs> and that maybe that's a good thing. Life is truly multi-objective, right? We, we expect that. So what we want to do is we want to at least make sure that the variety of different metrics is represented. Um, and so we support easy addition of normalized metrics. There is this metric that I'm not even sure it's well, very well known in the ML literature at least, but it's known as performance profiles, and it's actually a relative gold standard in continuous optimization if you take a look at their papers and subsequent papers. Um, basically, it's some notion of like the relative speed at which an, alg uh, an algorithm is able to reach a certain level of performance compared to another algorithm. And so it's able to capture some notion of a normalized uh, understanding of how much better an algorithm is. Usually from, it's not always from zero to one, but it's like a, a relatively standardized scaling um, and invariant to a lot of things, such as if you uh, monotonically change your objective, it's gonna be invariant to that, which is important, right? Um, because oftentimes when you take your objective and you take e to the power of that, all of a sudden your metrics change. <laughs> so, so yes. Um, and in, in, in Bayesian optimization or black box optimization, you might not want that. So we also have some metrics. The log efficiency metric is essentially this performance profile, which is uh, some standard that we want to reach uh, according to the literature. Um, we also have other metrics like per percentage better that is almost like a ranking based metric. And you can also write your custom one. So, and so what that will look like is basically in our plots, there will be an additional plot that's added. Uh, here you look at the objective curve. And, and we'll see examples in our, in our tutorial collab of how these normalized metrics will help. But this is essentially just a preview of what it look like. And objective metrics are able to quickly tell you what's going on. Whereas sometimes when you look at plots with error bars, it's like messy, so. Okay, so let me go into the collab real fast and then just um, see. Uh, oh. It's like all sorts of stuff. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is just a preview of our benchmarking API. It's almost like an overview, actually, not a preview. Um, but uh, we also read the docs, so feel free to look at those as well in your spare time after this to get a sense of how to use our benchmarking. So the main um, import that we use is from import benchmarks. We also have subdirectories like experimenters, and later we'll have uh, analyzers. The objective is formalized as experimenter class. Part of it is we want to support, you know, multi-objective experimenters really quickly, noisy, uh, in some sense, multi-fidelity, early stopping related stuff too as well. And so we use an abstraction where we have evaluate function and we also have a problem statement. So the problem statement that, which is what Richard went over, is just the configuration for what kind of uh, search space this optimizer or this, objective is over. Um, so the experimenter will evaluate and complete the trial in place. So that is one slightly different thing about API. We didn't want it to return a bunch of trials. Uh, so it's actually returning a, a, a null. It's returning none. So what it'll do is, so for example, let's try to create a custom cookie experimenter for our cookie objective. So the way we would do that, oh, that's really interesting. 
um, is, so for example, you can uh, create a class. We'll subclass our experimenters uh, AP uh, Shrat class. So essentially, you just need to uh, put in two things and implement two methods. So the first method is the evaluate method. It's again going to do nothing in terms of uh, in terms of returning trials. It's just going to mutate the trials in place. Um, so for all these suggestions, we're going to compute and fill in the uh, measurements. So we can first take these parameters that we care about. We're going to assume that there are these parameters here. So in our case, there's chocolate. Um, there's chocolate. There's, uh, I think, salt and sugar. So let me just do that with you. OK, sugar. And um, we're going to say the taste is using the objective function that we had before, chocolate minus 0.2 squared minus salt. OK, this is a quadratic function. Um, and this code lab, by the way, I think is on our website. So for those of you guys who are following along. Um, OK, so now what we do is we take this suggestion and we complete it. And the way we complete it is we send in a measurement. In this case, uh, it's just a dictionary of uh, our, our metrics. So the metrics that we care about here is just the taste in our setting. It's just an objective. OK, cool. And sugar needs to be spelled correctly. OK, and then the other thing we, we need to do is define the problem statement. So the problem statement here, we have defined at some point earlier. Um, but I'll just quickly write it. So just to reiterate what's going on. So essentially, you define an empty problem statement. The first thing you need to mention is the search base. So we can add a float parameter. That's chocolate uh, from 0 to 1. And these are all things that, no matter what API you use, you have to specify at some point. Um, and so, OK, chocolate and then sugar, salt, sorry. So these search bases can also have um, discrete parameters as well. So, but in this case, we just made it all uh, continuous. And then what you do is for the metric information, which is the metrics that you care about, that's the second thing you need to specify. Um, here we say, OK, the one metric that we care about is taste. So the name is taste. And then we also have to say what our goal is. So our goal is to maximize. And the way we, we have like an enum for that here. Maximize. OK, and then that's it, at least for this problem. Cool. And so what we can do is we can make sure that the code doesn't work. OK, clearly does not like the way I don't do the problems. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I'm surprised that that actually even compiled. Well, there you go. Has no attribute parameters. So for each suggestion, suggestions. Sorry, some technical difficulties here, apparently. Um, this object, OK, so it's, I'm thinking it's a list. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. That's what it is. Thank you. It is hard when you're <laughs> doing this online to find the misspellings. Okay, perfect. Um, so there's also a solution here as well. But um, we just want to go over uh, how you would more or less code it up if you knew how to spell correctly. Um, so perfect. So what we just did here was we created the experimenter. We have, you know, like we filled in some parameter values for the trial. And then we evaluate the trial. Um, and then the metrics here is just the taste, which we evaluate point. All right. OK, cool. Now, that was just the semi-tedious part of defining objective function. Now for the relatively more fun part. Once you define the objective function, let us run two algorithms with the cookie experimenter. So conceptually, every study is essentially just a loop between that algorithm and the objective function. And it's just evaluating, figuring out the suggestions, evaluating, and so on. So we use the benchmark runner routine to figure out how to, uh, to specify how to uh, mutate the benchmark state to mimic how we want to uh, describe this interaction. Sometimes it is more complicated than just the basic loop. Um, and so the next thing we have to do is initialize these benchmark states with two algorithms, the random for now and the grid designers. So we'll have the same experimenter in our benchmark state, but we'll just have different algorithms. So um, let me just take a look. So yeah, so let's create some benchmark states, um, grid designer factory. So we just, in, this is a factory for the grid designer. And then we also have these um, benchmark state factories that are um, easy wrappers that create benchmark states for you. It's really not doing too much. Um, so we just feed in the experimenter and then the designer factory here, it's grid designer factory. Here, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I need, need autocomplete on. <laughs> Benchmark states that append. And then, and then these factories, generally speaking, just have a call method with no arguments. So when you call it, it'll just create the benchmark state. So we have this. And then we just do the same thing. I mean, we can do a for loop later. But uh, essentially, what we can do is we can make everything here just random. And I think this is random designer, so no search. OK, perfect. So we created two benchmark states. Um, one of them has the grid designer as the algorithm. The other one has a random designer. And so we can define a runner, which is the immutator for the benchmark state. The benchmark runner will just specify what it's doing. Uh, so here, we, it's just generating a suggestion. So it generates a suggestion, it creates a trial, and it puts it in the data store. And then evaluate active trials will take the trial from the data store, evaluate it, and feed it back to the algorithm. The algorithm really extracts the, um, the, the trials that are currently in your data store and generate suggestions. That, that's actually what's happening. Um, and then l let's say we do this 100 times. Uh, so we just run this code here. And indeed, we'll have uh, 100 trials. That's the goal of uh, this specific benchmark runner. And this trials, these trials will be completed. So they should have, all have measurements in them. Yeah, so that's pretty much how to run different algorithms. Uh, as you could see, you could have something more complicated as well, but we won't necessarily go over that. Um, the goal is now you can convert these benchmarks 
states into like visualizable performance plots using our analysis library. And for single objectives, we can quickly extract and plot the objective metric uh, so far. So um, here we just have a simple um, utility library for you guys in the analyzers subclass so, or subdirectory. So if you import from user.benchmarks import analyzers, you can use a two-curve method to quickly visualize what's going on. And here we just demonstrate it for you. Um, so here we're plotting just algorithm one and zero and one. I didn't use a dictionary, so <laughs> I think algorithm zero is grid search. Um, so the relative performance of the two plots, or two, two algorithms. And then finally, we wanna show that our setup is actually very flexible. So <clears throat> now that you went through all the trouble of designing or formalizing what we've, uh, of, of the objective and also the algorithm, you get some things for free. And so specifically, with relative ease, you can add a bunch of different settings that might be interesting to see how well your algorithm is doing. So one thing is you can add noise to your benchmark if you want to uh, by just simply wrapping it around uh, an, another experimental factor. You can discretize one of the bench parameters. Instead of rewriting everything, there's a quick discretization uh, utility. You can add normalized metrics for analysis. So there are additional metrics you can add other than just plotting the objective. Um, you can also add another algorithm to compare against. And also you can run different repeats. So I'm not going to go over how to write the code, but just quickly, you know, like you just specify some algorithms. You have a cookie experimenter factory. Again, this is serializable. As you realize, everything here is serializable. And so here, you know, we have some metadata for now. It's just the name. Um, for if you want to add noise, there's a quick way to add noise. If you want to discretize, there's a quick way to discretize. Um, and then essentially, you just run this loop here to run your uh, benchmark states with, with our runners. And then you take all your results and you plot them. So here are example plots. Sorry, it's not super um, readable. But you can see that, um, generally speaking, you know, the first plot here is your typical objective plot on the left. Um, this is just, actually, this plot at the bottom is the regular cookie experimenter that we looked at. Um, maybe here, you know, it's very clear that I think blue is eagle, which is our evolution strategy. You would expect that to do the best out of all of them. And maybe here, it is easy to tell it's doing the best, but this normalized plot makes it very clear, you know, this is doing better. Um, right here, this is when you add severe Gaussian noise. You can see that the evolution strategy, well, from this plot here, you know, you don't know, really know what's happening. Everything's so blurred. Um, and, you know, in terms of objective, it might be a small difference, but in terms of actual performance, it might be bigger. Like here, in terms of the normalized metric, it's clearly better. Uh, but here, you know, when you look at the normalism metric, you can see that it's actually just not performing. Like it's because of the noise, it's getting misled into maybe a, global, a, a local optima. Um, and here is when you discretize one of the parameters, uh, the evolution strategy does decent, but maybe not as well as the continuous. So there are use cases for different metrics, different benchmarks, different settings, uh, that, and we hope that you guys will play around with that, add your own benchmark, add your own uh, metric, and see how well it does. So, yeah. So that's pretty much the end of that. Um, we have five more minutes for questions. And so, by the way, we hope that you'll try all these things out for your uh, BBO needs, and we have those links provided for you guys, so. All right, um, thank you very much for the awesome talk. Um, I think there's already a first question by Eddie over there, so go ahead. Yeah, very cool. Very cool, thanks for the talk. Do um, you support other x-axis metrics? So for example, time can often be important, especially when you consider 
certain optimizers may take a long time to update and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, so essentially, I think this was mentioned before, each designer can keep track of how much time it's using, which is, you're right, time is a very important thing. So what we do is we, each trial, we can put in metadata to figure out how long that trial took to suggest. And then what we can do is we can plot them using the metadata. So there is like a plot metadata metric, like a class that extracts all the metadata from each trial and then plots them. Thanks. Yeah. A uh, minor question actually. Uh, if we talk about all of these random things that we did in the end, for example, with the noise and so on, I'm wondering whether for reproducibility it's just that you see the overall concept once, or do you have to see it every time you do one of these random things in the process? For seeding, for yeah. reproducibility, yeah. So we do support seeding in, because like, we use JAX, and so essentially everything in JAX is, has to be seeded. It's actually forced by the API as well. Um, so for reproducibility, we do recommend you to use seeding in both the benchmarks, which is seedable and the uh, algorithm. And then other than, in terms of that, that's all, all you need, right? So if you do want to make it reproducible, you can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe let me ask one question. So. Um, what would you think was the like one of the most interesting things you have done with, with a tool yourself? So what was been like really exciting for you optimizing? Wow, <laughs> I've never had that question before. What is the most exciting thing for me to optimize? Well, depending on what I can say, really. Um, one thing we could say is, in terms of social impact, um, there was an optimization that we did within Google, where we optimized like plane routes, where if you drive a plane across, or not, you don't drive a plane. Well, actually, maybe you do. You fly a plane um, across these specific parts in the atmosphere, it will cause these uh, streaks to form. It's almost like a wake when you're boating. But there will be these streaks, and that will increase greenhouse emissions because of the extra clouds or somehow creating issues with the atmosphere. And so we can optimize for minimizing the number of streaks while keeping like the route relatively efficient because you don't want to also increase gas consumption. Optimizing the classifier. Sorry. So optimizing the classifier. Yeah, or optimizing a classifier. Um, so yeah, that's a cool ex like, um, thing that we've done with uh, the Google Science teams. Um, the typical experiment that Richard was talking about was actually cookies. We have actually optimized cookies with Vizier and recipes with like, I think eight or nine recipe, uh, eight or nine parameters. And one of them was cayenne pepper, and it was non-zero in terms of the amount of cayenne pepper the optimal cookie actually used. So that is one possible option for you next time you bake cookies. Awesome, yeah, that both, both sound like really awesome applications, so uh, thanks a lot. There's one more question over there. You mentioned um, multi-objective optimization multiple times, and I was just wondering, do you actually support multiple different objectives? Because you showed all the graphs you showed, you have like the trials and then one performance metric, yeah. or one objective performance metric. Do you support multiple ones? Let's say we have like three or four objectives. Yeah, we do. Um, it is a matter of developing it, but yes, we do have multi-metric support where you can add, for example, multiple information. Oh, metric it's information. not even presenting, it's okay. Oh. It's okay. You, you can add multiple metric information. We do have algorithms that you can try already with like scalarization, multi-objective support. And then when you plot it, what's known as the hypervolume optimized or hypervolume metric, I think is what most people use. And so we have utilities to compute that hypervolume metric and then plot it. So, uh, it would essentially use all the same code, and you would be able to, instead of seeing the best objective so far, it would be the best hypervolume, like cumulative hypervolume at, at that iteration. So, uh, yeah, the end to end pipeline is supported. It just hasn't been fully mature yet in some respects, so we, ha we, didn't, we just didn't show it. But if you tried uh, algorithm right now and you ran the same code, it should work. Okay, but hypervolume is population-based. Let's say you pick an algorithm which is 
reinforcement learning, so you have just one prediction at a time. So would you be able to display just each objective for each of the trials, if that makes sense? Oh, yeah, if you just want to visualize each objective as a function of iteration, you could also do that if you want. Okay. Yeah, cool. and you would change the plotting code slightly, but yeah. Okay, thank definitely. you. Yeah. All right, yeah, let me take one more question, unless there is an online question now, or it doesn't seem the case. Awesome. And uh, let's do one more question, and then let's all move over to lunch. Oh, that worked. Um, yeah, you mentioned the eagle strategy to uh, optimize the acquisition function, right? Could you maybe give an uh, intuition on, on this eagle strategy and how it works? Yeah, so the eagle strategy is an uh, evolutionary strategy. Evolutionary strategy, generally, you have a population of uh, parameters that you currently think are promising. And then from that pr parameter, you do mutations like small perturbations or like crossovers to get a next suggestion. And based on how well that suggestion evaluates to, you might replace your previous fly. So it might kill off your parent or something like that. I mean, it sounds weird. But, um, or it might replace your parent. Um, and so you have these kind of promising flies or promising parameters at multiple parts of the search space. And then you run this mutation optimization. And eventually, you get to a point where sometimes you might get stuck at a local optima. So we might have to randomly reinitialize, re but that's basically the evolution strategy in a nutshell. There's a paper on this called uh, Firefly, the Firefly algorithm, I believe. So that's what we base why, it off. Why of. is it better? Why is it better over gradient-based or any other algorithms? Yeah. So we use this method mainly because of its flexibility compared to like gradient-based methods for optimizing the acquisition. Um, for like discrete and categorical variables uh, because the gradient based methods tend to want to go, especially when it's discretized search space, it wants to go like somewhere in the middle between the two parameters, the, disc dis the discretizations. Um, and so for flexibility, we just stayed with the, the evolution strategy. Also, we find that it does decently well. Like a lot of people use like MCMCs to uh, approximately optimize often. So this evolution, this strategy, evolution strategy is almost doing like MCMC. And so we find that it does decently well. So we never, we never switched to the gradient based, well, we, we tried some gradient based methods, but it didn't really improve anything. Um, so yeah, like exactly ac optimizing acquisition seems to never really matter. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Then uh, let's thank the speakers again for this awesome tutorial.